Howdy, everybody. I'm Tom Cheatham from University of Utah. Welcome to PERC 21 again and uh, the CARC Campus Research Computing Consortium Town Hall. Um, we have a panelist to, just, to do most discussing. I just get to introduce uh, what we're doing. Patrick, if you hit the next slide. So I'm not going to read this slide. Um, it's kind of gives a one shot overview of where the Campus Research Computing Consortium is and how it's evolved from its initial roots. <coughs> Excuse me, the important aspects are, we're trying to advance research computing and data and associated professions on our campuses. And research computing and data is a term that's broadly defined that spans from software to IOT to um, networking and other aspects. It's just, if we tried to put all the words into the discussion, it would be too complex. So we've narrowed it down to research, computing, and data. We're focusing on career development and visibility. Uh, and essentially, we're representing a community of professionals that serve as the interface between research researchers and the technology, computer, computational infrastructure, and services that they need to do their research. And we want to advocate for this because on all of our campuses, we know it's a challenge for us to be recognized. Uh, and supported and sustained at the level we need to be. And so we have various working groups, uh, uh, the People Network, which you'll all hear about by others here. We've got uh, representatives from our leadership team that are gonna talk about lots of different aspects of where we are and where we're going. Uh, and it's a very exciting time. And we aim to be a very inclusive group. Uh, we all have our own identities, we, we respect that. And we wanna bring the community together and, and collaborate with shared credit, shared attribution. Uh, we're not a huge community really across the country. We all need to work together to kind of make, make people realize that research computing and data professionals are key elements of supporting research and researchers at your universities. So I'll turn it over to, uh, I think Lawrence next for uh, talking about people network and so forth. Oh uh, no, logistics. Just... Yeah, so we're, we're gonna go kind of uh, in a different order than what was shown on that first slide and first talk about our operational groups. Um, the CARC Logistics Group has been around since the early days of CARC and really sort of helps coordinate efforts across groups, <clears throat> uh, make sure that the chair's leadership team meetings occur, and then does other things uh, or sort of coordinates and leads other efforts related to administration. So logistical aspects of putting on workshops, uh, making sure that our reports are all completed, for example, to NSF for the, the various funds that um, help fund aspects of CARC's work. And um, we also maintain CARC infrastructure for um, all of the other groups. Um, Sorry, I didn't know if there was a question. Um, so that includes if, if you have an idea for an interest group, so a sort of discussion group around a particular topic relative to research computing and data, or you wanna to put together a working group defined uh, as having more specific objectives. And you'll hear from some of our working groups later. If you're interested in starting up a working group of research computing and data professionals that's relevant to this community, um, we have quite a bit of infrastructure that you can lean on by becoming a CARC working group or that you could even use if you weren't officially a CARC working group. So this includes the ability to post information about what you do on web pages and our blog posts um, through our email list and the people network. We have templates and best practices for group charters, meeting documents, and how to run um, effective meetings. Um, and that includes access to a Google instance that includes everything that you would expect from a nice Google instance. So if you're interested in starting a new working group or interest group, we've got a page all about that and even some specific instructions and support from the logistics team to help you with that. And I think it's next to the engagement group. Right. Thank, thanks, Lauren. Um, like logistics, the engagement operations group, um, unlike working in interest groups, is a standing committee without an end date or a single product objective. The group focuses on the people of CARC um, and how to engage them with the CARC community and participate in CARC activities. So assisting um, research RCD professionals to find CARC resources means helping the people network tracks, the working groups and the organization as a whole to identify and provide for RCD professionals who might be interested in CARC activities 
whether it's so they can listen or present at on track calls or becoming more active in interest or working groups. This includes improving and expanding our website content or the resources available in um, our Google Docs and Teams areas. In 2021, the People Network mailing list has grown to include over a thousand email addresses, but we recognize that there's, this still doesn't include many RCD professionals. Um, we also wanna get the word out about CARC to those who um, might not obviously look to CARC, like data librarians or research software engineers, or anyone else who supports research and researchers. The engagement group is helping um, with consistent and current messaging on the website so that you as RCD professionals um, can use the content to do your jobs better. We also want to recognize your efforts so that if you have to, you can justify your time spent with the community. Um, so look forward to seeing our wall of thanks where we're, we'll recognize all of you who are putting forth um, effort to make CARC a better community. We'd love to have you join us. We can always use more hands and more ideas for improvement. You can contact me or my co-chair, Bob Freeman, directly or just email um, get involved at cark.org. I think now it goes to Dana. Yep, thanks, Claire. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm Dana Brunson at Internet2, and I'm one of the co-chairs of the People Network. Um, so first and foremost, this is a community of practice and the organizational structure is around a, a year round virtual conference so folks think of it as folks can join any and all tracks. Um, each one of the tracks has an email list and a monthly call that we also post on YouTube. Um, Lauren and I started this with the researcher facing track back in 2018 and Bob Freeman has is also now researcher facing track and is joined to help lead the people network. Um, so the tracks are organized mostly around the facing. So hopefully you've heard of those and if not, we can go on about it a long time. Uh, so you see researcher facing systems, data, software, strategy policy facing, plus the emerging centers track that helps meet the needs of folks that are wearing you know, all the hats or maybe you know, one person at an institution. Um, for the strategy and policy facing track, this is in development. We're working with the uh, EDUCAUSE Research Computing and Data Community Group and CASC on that. And for the software facing track, right now we, we point people over to the US RSC Association because they have an active community and doing a lot of work as you heard yesterday on their panel. Um, so if you, if you are new to the facings, I just wanna point out that this grew, up, grew out of some workshops um, with in an RCN back in 2017. And it's the idea is to just develop some language around which we can talk about the various roles in research computing and data. They're not intended to be mutually exclusive, but they have helped us organize a way for people to join affinity groups and talk about various aspects of the, the roles they fill in their work. Um, you'll also see this as a basis for how we've organized the capabilities model and professionalization work. Um, the idea here is to be very inclusive. Um, as always, it's an evolution of thought. So, you know, people have pointed out that, oh, security is missing. Well, security point is permeates all of these things. And we're having a plenary in August on security. And, you know, if it becomes apparent that it needs to have its own track, then people will, will work together to make that happen. Um, but right now there's a lot of things going on. So let's see. So each, each of these has um, a month, we do a monthly call announcement and share that out with other our related communities, the campus champions, the virtual residency program, the EDUCAUSE RCD group. And, uh, and that's, that's basically what that is, Patrick. Would you move ahead? So I do want to point out um, the People Network would not be happening without all of these folks. Uh, they, uh, you know, hopefully they're here, but, you know, I feel like this helps that one, it's a great group of people. I enjoy meeting with every single one of them. They, they cross collaborate and develop plans. Uh, they, two of them have steering committees. They they hope, hopefully are benefiting from this by developing their professional skills and their professional networks. And so I just wanna thank them all for everything they do. Next one, Patrick. And then some fun facts from the People Network. Um, as Claire mentioned earlier, we have over a thousand people subscribed to the People Network mailing list. Um, the most attended call 
it was the 2021 February researcher facing call about containers. We have have we've had 52 over 52,000 impressions on the YouTube channel in the last year. And so I feel like, you know, we are reaching people outside the community, which is one of the hopes. And then this is the highest highest views of one of the YouTube videos, which was on rack table. So uh, and one thing to note is many of those calls, um, especially the researcher and systems facing regularly have over 100 participants. So this is the gratuitous growth slide. Um, so it's been growing significantly over there. Uh, if you know, part of this is the community wanted these kinds of groups. And so together, right, all of this is community driven. So if you see something you want to do through logistics and engagement, we can help you and provide you the infrastructure to do such things. And if you want to join any of these, um, you can go over to the CARC website and look at the various facings and go to the how to join and sign up. And that's the People Network. Back to Tom. Mute it. Should have worn my you're on mute t-shirt today. Um, yeah, so now we're going to go talk about where uh, the various working groups that are in progress, where the status is, and then introduce the research computing and data nexus. Um, so, Patrick? Good. I'll just jump in. I didn't mean to cut you off, Tom. Is there anything else you wanted to say? Or? No, no, no. Perfect. Okay. So I'll start with the capabilities model. Um, we got a lot done this past year. We've been really active. Uh, we closed the 2020 community data set and published that report. There were 41 contributors, which uh, were a pretty representative mix of institutions. That report has been downloaded hundreds of times and read. The full report is on Zenodo, and we uh, produced a PERC 21 paper, um, which you can all check out here. This presented earlier this week. The award-winning version, pardon? Award-winning paper, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, thanks. Um, the we released the 1.1 version of the assessment tool, which was it's basically it's the same set of questions and topics. So we're maintaining continuity that way. But we streamlined the spreadsheet a little bit based upon impact input from the community. We also tweaked the weighting, and we will um, backfit that to the 2020 data to normalize that. Um, basically, people said that they didn't think it was quite appropriate the way we were mixing factors. We've um, hosted a ton of webinars, talks, office hours. Claire does a ton of work coordinating all of our office hours. Those have gotten really active, a lot of really interesting discussions. And the, we're, we're seeing a lot of use across a, a broad set of institutions. So this is showing the total downloads, not the people who contributed last year. Over 150 institutions representing 44 states and US territories, the District of Columbia, four Canadian provinces, which who aren't shown on this viz because I couldn't find a good tool to viz that easily. Um, we also have several UK institutions. And you'll see it's a pretty decent mix across Carnegie classifications, public, private, and EPSCOR. We're making some progress with smaller and minority serving institutions. We definitely need to do more there. And that's gonna be part of our effort in the coming year. Uh, we hosted a workshop on Monday that was focusing not so much on the model, but on strategic planning. Um, for many institutions, they use the uh, research the capabilities model as an input into their planning. And, uh, and so we had a really interesting, lively discussion there, including tools we might provide to the, uh, to the community to help them with strategic planning. There was a BOF hosted by a group of um, folks, a new working group actually at CARC, who are working towards an EPSCOR community workshop next spring at the 27th National EPSCOR meeting. Um, this is a grant led by Gwen Jacobs and, um, and um, Denise Baird at Montana State is also here and will be ready to answer questions. And Scotty was at the workshop as well. He's busy with another workshop on a timely theme of um, wildfires right now. So um, <laughs> otherwise he'd be here as well. We are working towards the 2021 community data set, which will combine two years so that we'll have a broader set. That's our plan is to have each of the reports have a rolling two year set of data. The, that community data set contribution period is open now and through the end of summer. You'll find a lot of support and discussion, both in office hours and on discussion lists. 
And I want to remind you, everybody, you've got plenty of time to complete your assessment and contribute your data for this year. We'd really encourage you to do that. We are happy to have funding through the new RCD Nexus program to re-implement the tool on a more robust platform. It'll be a hosted survey platform to provide a much better user experience. Uh, the same underlying model and structure will be there, but it will definitely have a more sane process for data aggregation and analysis, which um, I will be very happy about, uh, given that I do a lot of the work on that. And then we're really excited to be building a new portal for data exploration. So rather than the PDF reports that we've been producing, there will actually be a portal where you can go through and filter on, on your own data sets the way you want and think about slicing and dicing the data uh, so that you can compare results and do benchmarking. You can also um, do a comparison to your previous year assessments or previous assessments. You may not do them every year. And then we've also got funding for expanded support, which is we think is going to be really important, especially for smaller institutions that are just getting started with this and aren't exactly sure what they want to do with it. And so uh, we'll be hosting uh, training sessions and webinars, but we'll also be able to have in, uh, custom or individualized consultations available to institutions to support that. So we've got a lot going on, a lot going on ahead of us, and we're really excited about what we're going to be doing. So if anybody's interested, please get involved. There's, we're always interested in having more input and feedback on the model. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Scott, who's going to talk about RCD professionalization. Thanks, Patrick. <clears throat> so a couple of things that you heard about already um, is the professionalization. The concept of professionalization is we've been wrestling with it for some time. We had these RCN. Um, meetings that many of the people who are on this call were part of back in 2016, 2017. And that's where we really solidified that concept of the facings, which we then carried over um, after CARC was started and created the, the professionalization and workshop where that concept, I think, held true. And then we created the, um, the document that's the job elements and career guide document. And it was interesting this year as a part of the virtual residency program that uh, Henry Neiman at OU hosts, um, I realized that like through some feedback that like three years ago, um, we've matured some of our idea, ideas since then, we should really revisit that doc and, and publish it um, because it's kind of always remained in this draft form. Anyways, and then in 2019, we um, had another set of activity where we've created the job family matrix. Um, since then, we've had 137 different people download the, the job matrix. There's like 31% looking to implement it and the remaining 69% with just general interest for reviewing it and, and thinking about it. So there's a significant interest then of people who want to do this implementation. And as a part of the RCD Nexus, one of the work activities is to kind of promote the matrix further to provide some consulting around how to think about implementing it at different institutions and kind of create a, a group of ambassadors who have went through this process at their institution that can help other institutions. Um, and then um, last year, we kicked off the um, workforce survey um, working uh, activity, um, which I'll touch on next. And then just in the spring, um, we launched the career arcs activity, which Patrick will tell you about. Next. So um, this is just a quick teaser um, because we have a boff coming up um, after like just shortly after this. Um, but the the workforce survey of what we were calling like the, the census um, previously is it kind of spurred out of activity from we had the um, there was a CI professionalization workshop this past summer um, that was hosted by Purdue and uh, a group of us uh, from that then wanted to continue this work and really is we went through the process of performing a, a literature review of various other types of surveys that were you know remotely close to this um, spent a few months determining um, what we thought would be provide the most value for um, RCD professionals as individuals, as well as data that that would be helpful for like hiring managers. We had a little bit broader scope, I think, in our head in, for, before we started making um, the survey, and we're also going to include like a survey that like directors would take and about their whole um, about the people and stuff like that, but we had to scope back and just do the individuals uh, related survey. And then in March um, through April, um, really beta tested the survey out and submitted it through IRB um, with uh, Christina from Northwestern as the PI, um, doing all the work through her local Northwestern IRB. Um, and then we um, launched the survey. Um, so that's been 
that's been the process thus far. Next. Um, just to give you an understanding of who's been in this um, activity, um, myself is kind of the, the you know, chair of running the activity itself. And Christina, we have bolded here, because she's the PI on the study. We'll do a lot of the data analysis and it's done all the work of creating this, creating the actual survey within Qualtrics and all that. Um, and then um, Amy, these are from UC Berkeley and Ashley Stauffer and from um, uh, Penn State and Tim um, and Jay and Kim, um, which will all, a uh, collection of us will be uh, on the box later. So there's a little advertisement of when it is. Next. Um, the survey itself, the main goals of it, I kind of touched on, but just to reiterate, the, um, we want to be able to provide an understanding of, of data. Like there's a real lack of data that we can use as, as hiring managers or as an individual. Um, if you were in a larger professional organization like I used to be in American Chemical Society, every year there's a published thing that is the survey that they take with all the professions. And you can really look and see how you fall in that and, and your specific kind of division of chemistry and back then, right? We want people to be able to think about the different facings and how they fall into that um, space with actual data. So that's the data that we're trying to, to create. And we hope that the aim um, of it will aid in attracting and retaining and diversifying um, the talent that we have. Um, we can also then use that data to compare against other academic and technical workforces. So against maybe all academic IT, as opposed to just um, research computing and data field um, against other um, places like outside of academia, like maybe within um, our Department of Energy or other things like that that have very similar types of roles and responsibilities. Um, and then we also want to um, characterize the types of job positions that are present in the field based upon not just what their job title is, but what the actual work they do. So we spend a lot of time trying to characterize the work that's being done. So, and right now we're in the middle of survey time. So here's a little information on that. How does it benefit you as an individual? Next. Um, we'll have data. We don't, we don't really have any of this data. Um, and we'll have this data based upon responsibilities and compensation and you know, representation of what you do in the field. Next. And who should take it? That's been one of the questions that comes up. Everyone should take it. Everyone who's ever been or is currently supporting research and a staff, as a staff, should take this. It's meant uh, not just for people who are in a centralized research computing and data group. Um, and then next. And how can you help? Um, we've sent out a number of emails about the survey to some standard lists. Um, there's a lot of other lists and a lot of other communities that we're not touching now. So if you've seen the survey and you're like, oh, I'm a part, I'm a part of, say, um, RMAC, which is, like none of us in our group are part of RMAC. We could definitely use somebody who could grab the survey and hit it up with that list. Um, try to spread the word also just internally within your own school. Um, and, and the more data that we have, the better representation of the current snapshot um, of, of what this is. So, yeah, and it's, it's not a long survey. It's like 15 to 18 minutes. Um, next, I think that's on to, I think we transition to back to Patrick here to talk a little bit about um, the career arcs part. Thanks, Scott. So um, in addition to all the work that Scott's talked about, um, uh, we've got another thread that, that got started. We, we originally started it several years ago, but we did not have a lot of the resources to really pursue it. And we've recently um, gotten that energized again with the help of a, another whole set of people who are working in um, gathering around this. And it's really recognizing the challenges for professional careers that individuals don't really understand research computing and data as a career. There's no formal career path structure, um, little awareness of the career potential. And folks who are in a in hiring manager position really struggle to recruit and retain cap staff. This is something we hear again and again in the workshops that Scott's talked about and others as well, where they don't know where they can go and find people and how they can develop folks that uh, haven't come up through RCD um, you know, they haven't been in, in the position in a long time or they haven't been in group for a long time. So the career arcs resource was really designed to address those challenges. And the elements of a career arcs resource then, as we've been defining it, are to gather narratives of how and why existing RCD staff got into these roles. So the idea is to let people see um, others like themselves 
who have gotten into these roles and how they did. And it also helps groups and managers understand the diversity of career paths into RCD. It's not all folks who came up through either computer science or through a computational science. And the idea is that the emergent patterns will help us identify both opportunities as well as gaps to inform some strategic planning around recruitment and retention. And then uh, we're looking for examples of effective recruitment programs. Some people have figured out where they can go and actually find people and develop them. And we're going to be looking for patterns of those and share those with the community so that you can get ideas for how to improve your own paths in them in that area. And then another thing is that people who are in these roles often don't know where they can go. And, and a big issue for retention is how do you make a career path sound exciting to the folks who are in your roles? And so one of the things is to understand where do people grow? What are the different options? It's not just going into management or, or one particular area like that, but we want to give some examples of where people decided to go once they were in a given role. And this also relates back to the HR job family matrix in terms of understanding from a given role in a structured manner, where can you go next? And then finally, uh, understanding that some people will leave the academic world and they'll go into industry, but that doesn't necessarily mean that they're doing something fundamentally different. Uh, there are a lot of industrial research areas where they actually have HPC centers supporting what they're doing and understanding um, how and why people do transition into that and in some cases transition back. So we're looking for a broad range of stories there. So, so far the working group has been collecting and, and reviewing example narratives to understand what the key things are that we really wanna focus on and what the key questions are. And so that when we're um, turning this into a survey, which we wanna do for a broad set of somewhat shallower data, as well as an interview script for a smaller set of very deep narratives, what are the key points we want to elicit so that we can build a really useful resource in this area? And I want to give a shout out to the working group members who have been working on this. I really appreciate it. Again, as with so many things, they're all volunteers and they're making time out of their normal professional environments to actually make this happen. And that's, that's a lot of what really makes CARC what it is, is that a lot of people think this is important and are working on it. So thanks to all of them. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Claire, and she's going to talk about another area of the RCD Nexus. Um, thanks, Patrick. Um, so looking forward to the NSF Center of Excellence pilot, the RCD Nexus, we want to um, build on the good work already happening, all the stuff that you've, you're hearing about, um, addressing the current needs and looking to the future. So to do this, we want to provide a resource and career center where we can focus, uh, where our focus can be categorized in three areas. So, um, supporting RCD professionals, um, provide training and development opportunities, building the community um, started and going strong in CARC and in other places, um, helping RCD professionals, uh, helping RCD practitioners to grow and do their job better. And we'd also like to help those who are looking to move into an RCD profession, um, that this might be a resource for them as well. Um, next slide, Patrick, thanks. Um, in the second area, we want to address students, those who are working with us in research, computing, and data in student roles, and those who want to develop into RCD professionals. Again, building on the good work going on now um, to provide examples and resources to build your own student programs. Next slide. Um, in the third area, we want to look at um, RCD from the institution's perspective. Um, what resources we can provide to the institution to support their RCD programs and professionals, um, and pointers and support products like the RCD capabilities model for strategic planning, the professionalization effort, career arcs for program um, growth and improvement. Thanks. Um, so here we are. But I just wanted to mention part of what started this was several years ago, I noticed and others noticed that we were spending a lot of time in a variety of meetings complaining about all of the same things, but not make, making a whole lot of progress. And so while it's great to have so many of these communities and programs, it's also challenging. Um, many of these challenges 
you know, are better or more effectively addressed if we can all work together. Um, so we want to learn how to leverage each other, do warm handoffs between groups. And another big challenge is, is for those that are new to the RCD community to know where to go for mm -hmm. the kind of help they need and also to feel included. Going to work? Yeah. So, so this, this work, like, like, Mint, thank you. Um, like all the others here, aims to be inclusive and to benefit the community broadly. Um, if you do not see your favorite group here, please let me know. This this is not to meant, meant to be the final diagram of these issues. Um, next slide, Patrick. So so here's the timeline. Um, we started, you know, after all these meetings, was to was to plan a ecosystem workshop, and so we we put that together and did it at in an April 2019 at the CNI meeting in St. Louis. Um, it brought together the groups that you saw on the previous slide, and this led to um, a couple subgroups that came out to do a clearinghouse survey and work on a visualization for these things, and the preliminary results were presented at a plenary panel at Perk 19. Um, and then we did another, we did a paper and a presentation at Perk 20. Now, then something happened in the beginning of 2020 that caused us all to get busy with our day jobs. Um, but then in the fall of 2020, last fall, many of you were there, uh, we had a NSF cyber infrastructure workforce workshop, and I see Alan is here. So uh, shout out to him for, for supporting this work. Um, and one of the topics of discussion was to form a community of communities, uh, a group, so a group formed and we've been meeting regularly since then to discuss the ideas around this um, includes folks from CAR, Campus Champions, USRSC, uh, and many others. Um, and then we recently got funded, has been discussed a little bit here and there, our, our low-key advertisement. It's the new NSF Cyber Infrastructure Center of Excellence pilot, which we're calling the RCD Nexus. Um, so along with a lot of the work you've heard about here, um, this work also, this, this program will also address some of these same challenges. Uh, next slide, please. So the idea um, is that, you know, looking at leveraging all the work that's come before, we've seen several themes that have emerged um, that we want to work on. So fostering and nurturing connections among the communities that support RCD professionals, curate resources for those new to the community, and, and collaborate so that we can develop a shared voice to advocate for this profession across these communities. And of course, to work together to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then a shout out um, because we learned the term boundary spanner at the ecosystem workshop. And I finally found a book with a picture of it. So I put it in there. Um, so we could, I could go on about this. And I'd love to hear from people who are interested in being involved in this work. So please let me know. Um, and, and I'll hand it back to Tom, I believe. I'm going to Ruth next, sorry. Yeah, I think Ruth. Okay, uh, welcome everybody. I'm here to tell you a little bit about a future looking effort and opportunity for you within CARC and that's the RCD Decadal Survey. Tom opened today's session with a reminder of what CARC is all about. And you've heard for the last 30-ish minutes about many of the activities that we and you are engaged in. And together, this collection of activities is focused on helping campus RCD and the associated professions advance. When we think about advancing as a profession, we've had lots of examples of activities in CARC. This week at PERC, you've had opportunities to participate in a number of workshops and sessions focused on professionalization and also on strategic planning and the like. But across science, there are these activities known as decadal surveys. And I'm sorry if this is review for you, not everybody knows that term, but they're done across individual science communities gathering input to provide a community consensus set of priorities and recommendations to their stakeholders, especially funding agencies, but not solely funding agencies. There are decadal surveys for the material science community, for 
our earth sciences, for all sorts of things. But we haven't had a decadal survey for the cyber infrastructure slash research computing and data field. And we believe that by bringing the community together, we have an opportunity to establish more firmly CI slash RCD as a discipline to collectively decide on the top priorities for the community and for research computing and data and a strategy to achieve those in the same way that the science communities that have traditionally conducted decadal surveys the voice that they collectively present has helped shape funding priorities for agencies and has helped shape directions. And it's time for us to make a more concerted effort to do the same. And the goal is to speak in spite of what Dana said about all of the communities of communities, that's absolutely true. But across all of them, can we come to some consensus about the shape of our field for the coming decade. Now, decadal survey, you think, oh, it's just a survey. Yeah, 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 but surveys are important. So we are going to be gathering data and input through surveys, including a pre-survey to inform what the final survey looks like, as well as conversations and discussions, not only with members of our community, but with researchers and with stakeholders from other funding agencies. We are all deeply engaged with NSF and we thank them very much for the investments they have for decades made in cyber infrastructure, research computing and data and the associated pieces and parts. But other agencies do as well. And we wanna be sure that we include the perspectives of those from communities that we don't interact with on a daily basis. Like many of the CARC working groups, and this is an interest group at this point. We do have regular meetings. I will say in the summer, it's hard to have regular bi-weekly meetings, but we're, we're trying. And we would love to have your help. If you are interested in participating in our interest group, please drop a note to me or my co-chair, Tom Cheatham. There are also a number of folks in the Zoom room right now who are participating in this. And we look forward to having you participate in every way. Yeah, I'll, I'll add that the decadal survey is really hard. It's really difficult. Uh, we really could use some different perspectives and help to move this forward. Um, if we think back a decade ago, would we predict where research computing and data is today? I wouldn't say we would have done a great job. We've expanded into cloud and new areas and the technology changes so fast. And rather than just a survey for astronomy, we're a survey across many, many disciplines, which adds to the challenge. So anyone wants to get involved, please let us know. And to go to the acknowledgements, and, we'll, and then we're going to hang out for questions from the audience. Um, but we really do want to thank the NSF for the original uh, CARC award, which kind of was a semi follow on for the uh, ACIRF. Um, I really appreciate that the program officers let us drive this forward and evolve CARC in ways that it differs considerably from where it was in the beginning. We, we changed it a lot. We learned a lot. We were also uh, very thankful for the opportunity for the CICOE uh, pilot award. And there's some other grants listed here that fund elements of different parts of our um, group. But really, it's a volunteer effort, mostly, primarily, where um, we've got a group of healthy volunteers that really invest a fair bit of time to try to move these efforts forward. So I'm going to stop here. We can have questions in chat. Um, or just un unmute yourself and talk if you have questions. Ask us really hard questions. Meaning ask Dana really hard questions. <laughs> or just speak up and tell us what you think we should be thinking about and working on or what we're not thinking about and we should be. 
Well, this is Jim Wilgenbush um, from the University of Minnesota. First, I want to congratulate you on your your vision. I think it really is inspiring, and I think the way that you uh, presented this to everyone, um, you know, really, I you know, it certainly gets me pumped up uh, for the work that lies ahead and the the importance of it. So, just just first, thanks uh, for doing that because it really is a, a volunteer effort for I know. Um, all of you. Um, the the question I guess I have is is where do you see, you know, in sort of going back, I'm going to pick on uh, maybe Dana a little bit in terms of defining that ecosystem. Uh, where do you see, I mean, real opportunities in terms of of having a, a more concrete view of the various um, entities involved in that really large and and growing and changing sort of space, um, you know, what is something sort of tangible maybe in the next year that CARP could do to help um, uh, better understand that space and make it work more effectively? Uh, yeah, thanks, Jim. That's a great question. And everybody should know that, you know, Jim's not exactly a plant, but he was co-chair of the ecosystem workshop and panel and paper. <laughs> um, and so, I, you know, you're not off the hook, Jim, number one, for sharing your vision and contributing to this work. And then I've, I've learned a lot from the community of communities working group that formed after the NSF workshop in the fall, right? Because for a lot of the time in the workshop, we all do this, right? We live in a little bubble and we get an echo chamber. And so really getting together and having some candid discussions with folks in other groups, right? That wanna retain their identity and do all these things. So we find ourselves having lots and lots of discussions. Um, and then the people outside of that group are like, what are they doing? They're, just, they're not doing anything, right? So these discussions are productive. I think understanding a view of the ecosystem is helpful, but I think that's invisible work to the rest of the community. So one of the things I've been thinking of are what are some actual deliverables that we can provide the community um, without getting into the politics of who's who and what they're trying to do. Um, and so, so, so some of these, like, I think, I think low hanging fruit is, is to create something that's relevant to newcomers to the community so that they know kind of what CARC is, what USRSE is, what the EDUCAUSE group is, um, carpentries, you know, we have so many resources in the community and I know, you know, I think Doug gives a great talk on whirlwind tour of resources and things like that and bringing it, bringing a place together that that people can go to and find out um, or from institutions, especially that are that are new that aren't yet supporting research computing and I think leveraging the data that's coming out of the capability capabilities model data sets and the the survey, um, make sure you fill out the survey and the decadal survey, all of these will help inform what the community deems is a priority. Um, and so I'm basing a lot of it off that. And also of course, what people are willing to do, right? The big question is what are all the things we could do? And then what are the things we should do? And what are the things that we can actually get the resources to do? So. And I'll add that it's, not my vision, it's not Dana's vision, it's not Patrick's vision, it's the community's uh, vision, we hope. And if we're not representing the community, uh, we need to be prodded to, to do that. Thanks. I also think there's an, you know, Dana mentioned different groups retaining identities. Some of what we're also doing, and it's built a little bit on what Lauren talked about of facilitating, for example, that the, the CARC has supported um, the capabilities model work to produce a data set, but this group of EPSCOR institutions is actually building upon that and doing their own thing. And this is an example of where it's not all going to happen inside CARC, but we can do a lot of the things where we bring people together to provide enabling data, to provide uh, enabling workshops and things like that. And I think that's really important too, is that we don't own everything. We're not trying to drive everything, but where we can where we can support efforts like that, um, there are communities that, that are going to go off and do their own thing and build on what we've done. And I think that's a really important concrete deliverable that CART can help facilitate. And I think um, Denise, are you here? If you want to mention, if you want to say anything about what that EPSCOR workshop is going to do. 
I was just going to second what you just said, Patrick. <laughs> so yeah, I'm happy to say a few words about what we're up to. Um, hi everyone, I'm Benice Baird. I'm a data curation librarian at Montana State University. And uh, speaking from all of us in the newly formed EPSCoR Cyber Infrastructure Working Group, um, we're a diverse group whose work is centering around recognition that increased access to cyber infrastructure and associated best practices is the next challenge for emerging and under-resourced institutions. And so the NSF has recently funded our efforts to boost awareness and communication and partnerships using the CART-driven RCDCM assessment and planning tools. Um, and so our effort is led by the University of Hawaii, Gwen Jacobs, um, and in collaboration with several other of us in EPSCoR uh, jurisdictions, including Alaska, Mississippi, and Nevada. Um, and our project is advocating for broad use of the RCDCM uh, assessment tool across uh, the nation's EPSCoR jurisdictions. And for those of you who aren't familiar with EPSCoR, I'll put a link in the chat in just a moment. Uh, you can have a look at that. Um, basically, it's uh, the states and uh, territories who receive 0.75% or less of all NSF funding within a given year. Uh, and so uh, we're working with other emerging and under-resourced institutions um, toward this assessment and planning and partnership workshop. So if you're interested to join us, uh, we're a welcoming crowd and please contact us. I can put the link uh, for our new park based webpage in the chat as well. Um, thank you. While you were speaking, Manise. Oh, you're ahead of me. Thank you, Patrick. <laughs> Thanks. I saw Kaylee on mute a minute ago. Kaylee, did you want to say something? Uh, yeah. Um, I just I wanted to sort of echo or uh, ask a question, I guess, but based on what uh, Tom had said is, do you guys have, and maybe it's early in the game, thought about how that feedback loop is going to work such that this decadal survey can really be owned by the community as the broadest possible definition? Um, and how you're going to make sure you, you sort of hear from everybody and make sure they're on board with what comes out. Yeah, that's difficult to answer. Um, it, it's a resource issue. The hope is that our universities start to realize that they can't rely on the NSF as a seed agency to support all research computing and data across all our campuses, that institutions are going to have to step up and provide resources to do that, or uh, the federal pool is going to have to be expanded to cover this. I mean, we see the growth in a number of users, number of disciplines, number of technologies uh, every day, and it's it's not sustainable at present. And then you go to an emerging center, it's even harder when you got one person who's trying to provide all the support ranging from cloud to Internet of Things to high performance computing. Um, if my administration can become aware of how important this is and they treat it like they fund an enterprise resource, enterprise platform or email, or other aspects that it's as important as that, that would be awesome. Um, but it's gonna be very challenging and I don't think we're gonna do it very quickly. Anyone else wanna comment on that? I see Sarvani has her hand up. Yep. Hey, uh, hey all, uh, first of all, First of all, thank you all for the effort that, uh, that CARC is undertaking for, uh, for the research computing and data community. Um, my question will be based off of uh, Tom's comment. How, how are, have, have, have you all thought about communicating the work that's being done at CARC with uh, uh, leadership, campuses leadership, such as the CIOs and um, other uh, communities that are not CARC and CAS? How are those efforts happening? Well, it, not a flippant answer, but like one step is we're going to do a panel similar to this next month on Internet to Online, whose primary constituency are the CIOs. And so I, I am trying to use Internet to connections to CIOs and others 
to help them uh, them learn more about it. Now, I've been surprised to learn there are many CIOs in the country who do care about research, so yay, um, and trying to get them, right? Just like with us, right? We have people who are champions for the cause and getting empowering the CIOs who do support research um, to champion the cause amongst their communities as well. And others might have more answers to that. I think another one is that getting together the idea to have this like policy and strategy facing group call where the mixture between kind of like the the effectively like to say the, the the center you know directors which is represented by all the cast folks and then all the other different types of people um with CARC and then the EDUCAUS part of the RCD so just having that connection also to EDUCAUS like Dana mentioned is is a EDUCAUS is a place that is well attended by CIOs and other like in academic computing and administrative computing. So other parts of the academic IT space. So if we can start to kind of mold some of this stuff and then we, I feel like if we have that kind of call that is of interest of that community, we could invite people to come into those conversations, which they would maybe see that as like the, you know, like we, oh, we go to Educause, let's go to this Educause slash card slash, you know, cast or whatever, like this thing. That, that might be a place where we can start to like onboard other people in their conversation that haven't in the past because they're in a different sector of, of technology than research. So that's one of, another way to think about it too. Claire, do you have your hand up? Yeah, so as, so as part of the, um, the NSF um, CI COE pilot, um, we're starting to make plans to um, reach out to these types of um, communities. In fact, Sarvani, I had a conversation with your CIO very recently, Ann Kowalczyk, and she's very, she was a wealth of knowledge for us and um, providing us with a lot of avenues on how to reach out to get to, to, get to that community and to, to understand how we can connect with them better. And I, I will... No, everybody here knows how much work really good communications is. Um, we'd all like to do a good job around what I'll call marketing and communications, even though some people cringe a little bit at that term. I think of it really just as telling your story and making sure that the people you care about who know your story understand what it is you're doing. It's one of the areas that we've struggled a little bit to find enough resources to do. We, we do as much as we can. Some of the groups have still produced a lot of blogs that people, you know, there's a lot of activity, um, but one of the things we are hoping to do with some of the new funding is to expand the resources we have. Uh, the engagement group that Claire and Bob were involved in have, have got a lot of ideas around this and we just need to execute on it. So I do think uh, your point is very well taken about thinking about some of the audiences, Sarvani, that we really need to pay attention to. And hopefully we're gonna have just a little bit more resources to devote to some of that and increase that level of communications out to those audiences. Thank you all, thank you. So this is Paul at Santa Barbara. I I guess I don't have a specific question, but I'd like to, to get your guys' observations. One of the reasons all of us exist in this field is to support either research or teaching. Um, and that's always the primary purpose of the universities. And while we're often talking about the, say, the CIO stack, there's a lot of times I feel we have more in common with, say, the people running facilities like an NMR or microscopy facility or something like that was wondering, IT spans so much areas, but we are also very focused on really the research as opposed to a lot of the IT systems, the business of running the university. So have we thought about looking at um, what things have been done well and what mistakes have been done within these facilities, say running an NMR or whatever else, even though that's much more focused? I think you bring up a really good point. Like in my role in research computing at Harvard, it's an, it's because it's 
through the division of science as we're housed, we're adjacent to like the sequencing center, mass spectroscopy and all that. And I think there are things to be learned about the way in which they run and operate. So a lot of those are run with some kind of cost recovery, right? Um, as an idea, they have some kind of interesting funding models that they've tried to, to go through. So I think there's a lot to be learned in what works and doesn't work in that space. And um, it's definitely something that we can explore more and maybe create some papers and stuff like that on, like to connect, to make that connective tissue between the two, because it is a part of the research, like support services enterprise, you know, like, yeah, we're aware that it's very distinct. Um, I, I don't consider myself a core. Uh, I consider myself a core of cores. So we're we're like a combined mass spec, NMR, everything facility because we're supporting such a wide range of technology and services. Um, the funding model is a very interesting one. Uh, question. Uh, and something that we should explore more because there's various models throughout the country ranging from total cost of ownership to totally free. Um, and what works best, uh, obviously researchers love free. Uh, they'll, they'll suffer from a little bit of, okay, I'll pay cost of hardware. When you say you gotta do total cost of ownership, not happy, researchers not happy. They'll put it in their closet and uh, run it themselves in the lab without security or compliance. Um, but it's a very complicated thing. I think we're more complicated than a mass spec facility or an NMR facility. We've got all the compliance requirements for security and data. And now this new CMMC stuff. Um, it's uh, crazy. It's getting more and more complicated. Well, um, Tom, that's a, that's, a, that's a good segue for, uh, for just to mention that I agree with Scott. I think it's an, it's an excellent question. Um, you know, having pushed test tubes for many years, um, you know, been bioinformatics and now in research computing, uh, I've seen, you know, all, all sides of that. Um, I, I, there are some opportunities. Um, you know, we are having a plenary in August uh, on security, and uh, that might be the first opportunity to start to address that. I think there might be an opportunity in the, in the people network to actually have other plenaries around core facilities. And, what are the needs there? And I can I can also um, think about my activity at Harvard on the research data management uh, working group and just the amazing work that's come out of um, the the RDM working group at at the medical school. Um, I I mean I always go to their website for their checklists. They did a you know survey on electronic lab notebooks, um, and I think they they and they've done that out of necessity from all all the problems that they've had with. Um, dealing with research and research data. Um, so I think we can probably bring many of these, these questions and uh, to, uh, to, to have um, further discussions. I'd like to actually expand a little bit and, and maybe go beyond what Paul was getting at in the question, but, but recognize that there's a lot of other kinds of labs on campus that have been much more entrepreneurial. Some of the software labs um, that have done big industry partnerships and they've um, gone a long ways in terms of reaching out that way and diversifying the funding. And they've also um, ended up being a lot more innovative and brought in a lot of ideas from other areas. So it's not, you know, I think there's, there's a bunch of different ways we can expand. Um, the other thing you mentioned, teaching and learning. And one of the things that I think um, is important is that, that in many areas, there's kind of a blurring of that boundary between teaching and learning as, more and more uh, graduate level programs and even undergraduate sometimes with things like uh, Jupyter Notebooks are needing to take advantage of some of the same kinds of resources and pursue some of the same things. And that means reaching out beyond some of our traditional boundaries on campuses and working with folks who are in the teaching and learning side. And in some institutions, you've actually got some really great folks in central IT and in those teaching and learning folks, for example, learning how to move applications to the cloud. I've seen institutions where the enterprise side was actually way ahead of the research side in terms of their use of cloud and their understanding of it. They didn't understand all the things that researchers face trying to use that, uh, but there's a lot of knowledge there. And I think that figuring out how to be more open, for some people, I think talking to, to central IT is a third rail. For others, they recognize that there's real opportunities there in terms of um, educating people back and forth and benefiting from the experience there. And I, I think it is worth clarifying that um, 
CARC, since its outset, hasn't really intended to focus specifically on centrally organized core research computing and data services and has intended to really represent the full scope of research computing and data service providers and the professionals that work within them, including people in core instrumentation facilities or even instrumentation facilities specific to a particular department. Um, I think our membership and participation in the people network has really been driven by people in core research computing and data services, mainly because there were already some existing communities like Campus Champions, ACI Ref, um, that tend to you know, coalesce people in, in that kind of representation. But there's definitely more that we can do, I think, to engage people in facilities on campuses where research computing and data services are more distributed, um, whether it be for instrumentation facilities or other things. Like at UW, there are certain things that central IT provides, certain things that our research computing center provides, but there are about a dozen uh, units or departments that have their own research computing organization services, clusters, um, data storage resources. Um, we're a very distributed campus and I'd like to engage more people like those who are on my campus that I've managed to pull in to CARC. I, I think this is also where the vision of the ecosystem comes in because core facilities actually have you know, their own organizations and have meetings that specifically address um, some of the topics that I think some of us would consider to be a little bit outside of research computing and data, um, but it does link. I mean, and, and I think again, having that vision where um, we actually try to portray those links in some tangible way is extremely help, helpful in terms of at least accelerating the connection to those communities that are trying to address those questions uh, more specifically to their, to their, to their needs. And it might be worth commenting that similar to Scott Yokel's point that there are things that we can learn from other disciplines. Uh, it doesn't mean that we have to be identical to them, but you know they've been around for hundreds, maybe thousands of years, and we've been around for 50. Uh, so there, there are things to be learned, not necessarily 100% emulation. Yeah, to touch on what you just said, John, I think one of the things that we, a long time ago in the RCN meetings, um, that's what we were wrestling with was like, when we talk about professionalization, where do we look at other things and what what have been successful and how they've been successful and what do we wanna do? So like things like a medical school, like the medical profession, which has its own professional schooling and, and law school, right? Um, which become to the, like the extreme, right? They're very exclusionary. It takes a lot of effort and you have to maintain a lot of things to stay in that space. We kind of fall in the middle, I feel like, um, with research computing and data, where we we want to be able to build these bridges and connect to the other communities and libraries and teaching and other parts to kind of build a rich ecosystem. But we need to do it in a way um, that's very thoughtful that we bring more people in to wanting to do this work with us because there's a huge shortage of the professionals in this space. So there's, yeah, there's, I think, a lot to be learned from thinking about like other groups who have, have done that middle ground and how like how are that more of a apprentice and tradesmanship style of things also um, our place that like they've done those well for years. How can we implement some of that in this inside of like the university confines, you know, it's a, and that another way feels a lot like what Lauren was trying to get at, which were or Kark appears to be more focused on the people who do things as opposed to the objects involved or the business models involved, because those are kind of all over the map. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's or at least good. providing spaces where the people who deal with that type of variability can learn from each other and share different practices rather than trying to say prescribe any one particular practice. Yeah, I, I think, think that also goes back to focusing on, I think we're starting to do that a little bit more as look at, you know, like researcher facing, for example. Um, you know, uh, we've always thought about it traditionally as, as the, in, in the RC centers, but, you know, we, there's researcher facing individuals across, you know, uh, many different uh, service units, et cetera, that, um, you know, we should, you know, if we're be, 
as we are trying to be all inclusive and bring them in as well. And it may take some specific outreach because they may not really think of themselves as, um, although we use those terms, they, they may not necessarily think of themselves in, in, in those specific roles. And I also think of data facing as, as one particular way where they are also researcher facing as well. And so really trying to, to highlight um, where there are similarities and, and overlaps. Um, and do I do outreach uh, as much as possible? But I would I would clarify a little bit. I'm not. I wouldn't say, John, that we're ignoring some of the issues that the strategy and policy facing folks face. We're as as somebody else said, we're not going to try to prescribe that. But many of those folks are looking for the same kinds of resources in terms of training and development. And what that may look like is just sharing a lot with other people or hearing about what's worked elsewhere, but also understanding that the, the financial models that are going to work in R1 are going to be really different from those that may work at an HBCU or a tribal college. And we need to find a way to especially bring up those emerging centers and get them to be um, able to take advantage of the broader community. And I think that's a big area of learning for us, frankly. Yeah, it makes sense. And it's more the center is the people, it, it sounds like. Uh, and you can't ignore the other stuff, but it's useful to have a place that you're coming from. Don't be shy, folks. Is your chance to speak up? For those of you who uh, mentioned your awareness of um, communities of people in, in instrumentation facilities and other core facilities that are not necessarily strictly defined as research computing and data. Um, are you willing for us to bug you about how to engage people in those communities? We need help from people like you who know these things and know who to talk to. Uh, I'd be I'd be more than happy to. We've we've done uh, a lot just in the last year to try to better organize our cores, and um, and I'm part of that uh, working group that was actually originally commissioned by our president, and then um, there's more focus been put on um, operating our cores, um, coordinating efforts, and so forth. And I'd be happy to share some of those experiences. And I'm, I've also posted in the chat. Um, uh, a regional association of core directors, and they have some really incredible meetings where they share great information that is very much focused on um, sort of the services that they provide. And I'm sure there are probably other regional um, groups that uh, do similar things, and hopefully we can share those as well. Craig, go ahead. You're muted. I'm not muted. My computer is disagreeing with me. Uh, I hear you now. Yeah, uh, it was. It wasn't. It, it actually wasn't me this time. It was my computer. Um, so you know, I'm just an old retired guy at this point. However. Uh, the research computing organization at Indiana University uh, has for many years actually been registered and uh, functions as a core within the med school. Uh, we were actually the first group certified as a score uh, as a core outside of the med school organizational hierarchy. Uh, and I'd be happy to offer uh, perspectives on that experience, uh, what, what, what worked and what didn't, uh, if, uh, if people want to pursue this conversation at some point in the future.
it looks like there's a number of folks who are involved in, in some of these, um, the other groups that we talked about in the community. And I'd be curious um, from the perspective of some of those groups, what you think our big challenges are, what do you think we should really be paying attention to when we're looking at this broader community? Well, speaking on behalf of EPIC, not any of the other groups I'm involved with, I think it would be really helpful for you guys to figure out what is and isn't in scope and for you to kind of figure out how you want communication patterns with these other groups to go. Right now, it sounds like you're doing a lot of really fascinating work. Um, but it's hard for me to tell, you know, what, what isn't in your scope. I mean, you know, what, what, what's one thing that you guys know this is related, but we're not going to concentrate on it. Research software engineers for one, um, they have their own group. Uh, we will work with them uh, as they wish. Uh, and we do have communications. Um, there is uh, a fairly large scope that's being looked at, but it's in separate working groups and separate pieces that are individual. So to change from an interest group to a working group, you have to come up with a plan, a timeline, and a, and a deliverable. Um, and that's what distinguishes from just being talking about it to actually doing something. And that's been one of the hallmarks of Cark is that we're actually producing products like the HR wireframe and guide, um, the capabilities model. Um, these were real deliver deliverables that we reached. Do we always match the timelines? No, of course not. And uh, the other scope is, again, it's more about the people than about the operations and infrastructure as, as John and Lauren both articulated very well. Anyone else want to answer? Yeah, I do. Um, so like Jen, for instance, with Epic, like one of the one of the things I would like to be sure is happening is if there is somebody who needs needs help and Epic is the right group to help them, that they have an easy path to get there to know about it and stuff. So one of the things we can do is to make sure that there's some sort of you know knowledge base or commun enough communications to go that like hey if you're trying to help researchers and do network you know data movements and the kinds of things you do with Epic that they know about Epic even if you know maybe they're new and haven't heard of it right how does somebody just come across knowing that Epic is there to help them and so I would like that gap to be filled so that it's a it's an easy thing for people to say oh I need help with X and they immediately come across Epic yeah I think maybe that's what I was thinking about was you guys have such a broad set of core expertise you know it'd be really you know Epic is one organization, but you know you could say the same thing, you know, for CASC or for Educause or for the you know the trusted CI work or or anything. So like with Epic, we have a really strong line of if security is involved, we loop in the trusted CI guys. Period. Day one, because because we don't have that expertise, and that's a really super easy line for us. But your lines are a lot more porous, so right. I think that's. Yeah, I think we need more boundary spanners, right? Because I try to stay, I spend quite a bit of time making sure I know all the all the things that are going on that can help people. And people, I get a lot of questions too, like how do I get help with X, Y, and Z? And I'm able to generally figure out who can help them. Um, but, I, but I'm just one person. Right, uh, but I guess <laughs> a, piece of it, a piece of it is, 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 is sometimes it's when you're defining a project that's this large, it's as important to say, we don't do these things as much as it is we do do these things. Otherwise, you know, you wind up the jack of all trades and the master of none. Right, and yeah. uh, my philosophy is that if someone is already doing it, we don't do it. And I think I think what's important is what we're kind of like when, when Lauren talked about the logistics, I think what we wanna be doing is facilitating community, not defining it or, or owning it or anything like that. So in one sense, 
we want to bound the scope very little in that we want to find out about all the different groups who are supporting research and figure out how to build ties to them, not so that we can subsume them, but just so that we do a better job of referrals back and forth where there are folks who say, you know, we need to do something about X or Y, then maybe we can be a home for a working group there or not. And so the scope, I think, in many ways is going to be kind of organic. It's, it's we look at the broad community, we make sure that we're doing everything we can to facilitate connections across that community. And then where people speak up and say, we really need something done about this, then we can help host a working group if we're the right place to do that to actually make that happen. And that's really, most of what we're doing has grown organically that way. Workshops have gotten together and people have said, we should have this, or somebody needs to do that. And we're trying to be a home for that, as opposed to saying, we're gonna own all this stuff. Right. I, I would also add, um, it, it's important to, I think, maybe clarify what we mean by in scope and out of scope. So in the scope of research computing and data, we of course want to be really inclusive. Research software engineers are professionals in research computing and data, just like um, research community facilitators are, right? The facings are sort of orthogonal to the idea of job categories and, and job titles, um, where any one of those might draw from or, or include professional activities that are researcher facing, software facing, systems facing, et cetera. Uh, but we certainly want anybody who feels like they support research computing and data needs to feel included. Um, and, and maybe an example of where there's sort of like a fuzzy boundary, but there is a boundary is, is with instrumentation facilities. There are quite a few people associated with instrumentation facilities and other core research facilities that maybe don't even have instrumentation, but provide uh, other supporting services to research. But there are computing and data personnel often associated with those. Um, and I hope that they would would feel included in a community or even just as associating themselves with, with the terms research computing and data professional, um, even if the organization they work for isn't only research computing and data professionals because it does something else. And so I think like Patrick mentioned, we need to reach out even to types of organizations and communities that are not specifically research computing and data professionals, but where those people um, exist so that what our working groups do is more inclusive and representative so that the um, platforms we provide for community discussion and expertise sharing um, have a more diverse set of perspectives that our individuals can learn from. And so um, on the working group side, if it's anything that advances the field of research computing and data or the work of the, the people and organizations that do that, I think it's worth you know considering supporting as a, a CARC working group. But again, the working group owns that work, not CARC. I guess the way to and the way to think is that there's a a challenge of an inertia of the right to get over creating a working group and then helping make it successful and define it, which is really just saying that how do you be a successful virtual organization, right? And and that's what it is. Like we. That's what we're doing as this collective. And I think the, there's a lot of work that the, the logistics group has went through and thought about and over years help refine what makes that work and be more successful. I've taken a number of the principles from this and tried to now implement within Harvard across what is our research computing and data council of like eight to nine different um, colleges and schools because it is the same principles of working across teams where, you know, like there is no HR structure, right? We're all just collaborating with each other. So um, I think that's, that's one of the things I think that's helpful that CART can help with a group. And I think that's kind of what I saw in the chat that Kevin kind of made it seem like it's like a makerspace. We provide some infrastructure and people can come in and use the space and we help try to make them successful at their, so in this sense, it'd be like the working group. And there are other groups out there that can do the same thing. Um, you know, that are, that are larger, more established groups. So that's, and I think that's what Lauren is saying that like, we don't, we're not saying that that's our work. That's the work of the people who did the, the that were in the work. We just try to create some frameworks and things that make them successful. Um, so that's, that is a slight difference in saying, I think that's what's hard Jim, to describe like, yes, we, we say we do or we don't do this, 
X, Y, Z. I think there are things that um, some of our working groups have sprung up, sprung up and thought about doing and then backed off and said, hey, we're not going to do that. And you know, there are places where we've, we've done stuff and been more successful and um, have then obtained funding to do it, you know, in a greater space that can contribute more back. So. Yeah, I saw the chat. Somebody said the CARC is kind of like a maker space. It's almost like an incubator to some extent. You know, a number of our working groups, like Scott just mentioned, have gone on to pursue funding. So somebody mentioned that a lot of the people who contribute to CARC are volunteers. To some extent, I mean, some of us are paid by various funds that have been procured to advance some of the work that started in working groups, or, you know, some of us on logistics have been paid from the original RCN grant for CARC to help make sure that the administrative and logistical aspects of CARC are working well. But there are quite a few, and we can call them volunteers, but somebody's paying for your time, <laughs> typically. Um, your institution, your organization, it, it's really a contribution, not just of individuals, but of the organizations that support them. Other thoughts and questions, even things that are completely in a different direction from what we've been talking about already. I've noticed a few things that have come up in chat um, that people have said about the blurry lines that we now have between research computing and teaching. Um, I think a lot of us maybe were forced into that during the pandemic because we were the, the quick turn to groups. Um, and there may be some interesting discussion to be had in the future amongst those who find themselves straddling that now academic computing space. Um, at Harvard, we are doing that. We have a small internal grant to like create something where we tied um, our e-learnings platform, or which is uh, Canvas, to open on demand so that we can just go straight into having courses to you know, use it without having to create accounts and stuff like that. So there's a lot of stuff like that that I then now that was how do we handle stuff like that going forward? How do we think about being a sustainable way now that it's become something that's needed or leaned on at least? Um, we did it in the sense to replace a lot of what was desktop lab space um, with applications that couldn't be moved off campus um, by the contracts they had. So. But I think that's a rich place for more conversation yeah, it's good, good stuff. I, it just occurred to me um, in way of maybe closing remarks since we're getting toward the end of time that, you know, of all the stuff that we're doing, and this is me wanting to thank all of my colleagues because I don't, I don't know if there's more meaning and happiness in my life than what comes from getting to work with all you people who are doing such amazing things. And I just appreciate all of you. And I'm grateful for all the stuff we're able to do together. So thanks. And I really wish we were meeting in person. Um, I had my first in-person science meeting last week and uh, there were only 10 of us there uh, together, um, 16 online. Uh, but the 10 of us felt like a family by the end of it because we've been so long away from uh, actual meeting with other people and stuff. It, we all bonded on new levels. And so I hope we can all get together and bond again soon. And, and I'll echo, I really appreciate the tremendous involvement of everyone in the community who's provided support. Initially, um, when I started out as chair, I felt uh, antagonism from the community, but now I feel uh, genuine involvement and support, uh, collaboration and inclusivity. It's uh, been awesome. And uh, this is a great community that's willing to work together with each other rather than compete.
for those who want to ask and know more about the survey, our boss starts in 15 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I just posted a link to. So I need to leave so I can go prep for that. Thank you, <laughs> so, Scott. And I think, thank you. I think it's quieting down. So I want to thank everyone for coming and participating. It's been great. Love to have the feedback and hear from everyone. You yeah. don't have to wait till next year to, to come hang out with us some more. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Hi, y'all. I grabbed the chat. I'll paste it in the notes. Thanks. See y'all at the boss. Yup.